Okay, crowd. Uh, so, these are um, Antonio, Jacopo, and Andrew from uh, the Shellfish team, which is um, from the uh, UC uh, Santa Barbara. And they will um, talk to you today about a dozen of years of Shellfish. And I have to read the subtitle from DEF CON to DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge. And yeah, how they automatically exploit stuff. So thank you. Give a warm applause. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for the intro. So I'd like to continue with saying who the hell is Shellfish. So Shellfish is a team of security enthusiasts that has, take, has started in UC Santa Barbara some time ago. Now, the original version of this slide actually said that Shellfish is a hacking team and there are lots of Italian in that. But then my colleague Antonio <laughs> pointed out that putting hacking team in Italian could have a, maybe they, they shoot us or do something bad. But, so we are not related to that hacking team. We actually, most of us do research in system security. What it means is that they are ba we are based, many of our team members are based in research labs and they publish papers that try to improve the state of the art of what is known in computer security. But we also play as Team Shellfish, uh, many capture the flag competitions. As a matter of fact, we have even released a couple of the tools uh, that we use both in system security and in capture the flag competitions. Uh, some of you may, may have used in the past uh, the publicly available Anubis and WebAWET. So you could submit a binary or a website and see how they worked. And today we're also going to speak in a, in a little bit more detail of uh, Anger, a tool that we have released, that um, team members in the lab that have worked on it have released recently. So just to brag a little more, who is Shellfish? Shellfish was born in that little building in the UC Santa Barbara, well known as the only university that owns a private beach, and that has a, has a reputation as a party school. I actually got this comment from a flight attendant on a flight, so it definitely has some bad reputation, but believe it or not, it's actually a very good research university that has employed several Nobel Prizes, none of which are in this room. And the Shellfish team has also expanded through uh, its alumni to other um, uh, research labs, such as uh, people in Boston who never see the sun, and Eurecom in France in Europe. And as you can see, we are a relatively international team. We have the majority of players are originally from Europe. Of course, we have a good representative of people from the US, some very great hackers from China and Asia, Brazil, Senegal, and unfortunately, we have no one from Oceania. If you want to, we are very open to recruit people, join one of our research labs. As a team, as I was saying, we play CTF. So I'm sure many of you have already played capture the flag competition. So I'm just going to give a very minimal primer that is going to be useful for us later. Uh, CTF is a security competition in which you do, you are presented with a challenge. It can be a binary program, a service, a website, sometimes even a hardware device. And the base, there are many variations, but the basic idea is that you understand how that works. You find where the secret is. You steal it from the other guys or from the challenge. You submit it to the organizers, and you get points. And uh, Shellfish has participated in many uh, CTFs, including the DEF CON CTF. Uh, it, is, it has even won the DEF CON finals in 2006. None of us were actually on the team at the time, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, in a sense, good memory. But uh, we do not only play CTFs. Uh, if you you may be familiar with the UCSB ICTF. ICTF is an attack defense CTF in which you not only uh, crack programs to steal the secrets from others, you also have to defend yourself and patch the binary so that other teams cannot steal secrets from you, but the service is still functional. And um, uh, Giovanni Vigna uh, was the originator of the ICTF. It used to be, as a matter of fact, the final of the security class of Giovanni. And it has evolved many, many times over the years. The ICTF has, in many ways, tried to innovate with a different style every year. Some years have, been very, work, have worked very well. Some other years have not 
were that, well, we have, in a sense, we have had many, many discussions even internally, I can assure you of that, but we have, in a sense, embraced the nickname of uh, chaotic shitstorm, and we have gone with the very, in my opinion, very brave and very good uh, attempts to innovate. Uh, if you have played in the last years, for instance, you know that we have tried to give um, uh, higher importance, emphasize the importance of network defense, for instance, or try to see what teams would do if presented with a huge number of 42 services and to see would they try to sort of defend all of them with the same approach, attack all of them with the same approach. And in the latest year, we've even gone with the full player versus players, uh, player versus player. Even the program themselves were written by the players of the competition itself. So if you want to hear more about the ICTF, uh, our base framework is um, the base framework that we use for the competition has been released in open source. We're in the process of preparing the new version. And you can also read uh, our paper of 10 years of ICTF to see, to get a little glimpse of what has been done over the years. But now let's get back to the juicy stuff. So why the hell are we here? Why should you be listening to us? Basically, we want to show essentially how you can go from this to this. <laughs> and We've been told this is a very American style slide, and we say, uh, Jacopo, Antonio, you guys have really gone American if you're showing this, but I'd like to, sh to um, have you know that most of these notes are actually $1 and $5. I think there's a $5, yeah, that's down there, so it's not actually that much money, but Shelf is actually, no, to, on, a, on a more serious note, Shelf is actually has won some money by participating to uh, the Diaper Grand, Grand, uh, Cyber Grand Challenge, and we're going to explain a little bit to you what that is, what it involves, and then we're going to go a little bit more in detail and give you an idea of how we decided to play the competition. And we're going to give not all the components, obviously, are public for obvious reasons. We don't want to make the life too easy for our competitors, but we're going to give you an idea of some ways that you can use to automatically discover vulnerabilities. And in particular, we're going to give you a live example using Anger. Anger is an open source binary analysis framework that can do many things, even more than we have used for the CGC, and obviously many more than we're going to show you in the live demo. And it's an open source framework that you can use yourself. As a matter of fact, if you're interested in Anger, and so also becoming very rich, you can uh, join us uh, later after this talk. In, we're going to organize a workshop. Andrew is going to be in charge in Hall 13. She's one, three, it's on the first floor. So if you want, you can join us later. We'll give you more details about that later. And finally, we're going to give you a hint of what are the next steps that we're going to take, that teams are going to take to participate to the finals of the Cyber Grand, Sand uh, Cyber Grand Challenge. Uh, as you can see, we're also very fan of acronyms like DARPA. So let's start with a, a basic idea. So I think most of you guys have heard of DARPA. DARPA is a, a research agency by the United, uh, part of the Department of Defense of the United States of America. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the role that it has played in the uh, creation and evolution of the internet. And DARPA's mission is, in a sense, to, um, among other things, push forward research in uh, approaching interesting problems. And Occasionally, the, probably the most famous one that you may have even heard in the press is uh, that in 2004, they started a grand challenge. No one was able to do it before. Make a car that can start at a certain point and alone, completely alone, autonomously drive from point A to point B. And you know, nowadays we hear there are many uh, very good uh, projects on making self-driving vehicles, many of which are actually realized. In 2004, believe me, it was not easy at all. As a matter of fact, in this 2004 Grand Challenge, none of the vehicles actually reached the finish line. So in a sense, DARPA has, in a way, uh, found a problem that no one was solved and tried to push forward to see, I challenge you, can you show me, show me what you can do to face this challenge? But now, as I was saying, there are, pro there are cars that do that. So now in 2014, DARPA has decided to start the Cyber Grand Challenge. And once again, it, it means completely autonomous thing, completely autonomous exploitation and patching other programs. And yes, what you see right there is a competitor. So as a team, 
you'll have this array of servers, free to do whatever you want with them, but you have to play a game. And the game is what we're going to talk in this little next slides. But first, let's just give you a, a, an idea of the current progress of the competition. Uh, the qualification has already uh, taken place. Uh, it was in June this year. Seven teams originally uh, joined uh, the challenge, and seven teams have been uh, selected as qualifiers after, this, uh, after the qualification event. The finals will be uh, August next year, and will take place in, at DEF CON in Vegas the day before the uh, DEF CON CTF finals. And as a matter of fact, the winning system will play against the humans. And let's hope for the best that the humans still win, because otherwise we're going to have quite a bit of problem. <laughs> and we're going to go a little more into details, but uh, if you want uh, an intro, in a sense, a more uh, usable intro, DARPA has a very nice website, uh, very flashy, in a sense, at uh, cybergrandchallenge.com. So let's talk about a, mo uh, a moment more about what is the CGC. So, no surprise, it's an attack defense CTF, exploit, patch. And again, you probably, as you can probably imagine, the way you participate as a team is not that you're given a program, you look at the program and you exploit it. And it's not even that you look at that program and you write the program that exploits that guy. It's not that you write the Python script that exploits this specific program. What you need to do is you need to develop a system that is going to be fed some programs and automatically, without human intervention, will find vulnerabilities, exploit, and patch them. Okay? Sounds simple, sounds easy. <laughs> it's not that much. It's actually interesting. I'd like to, you to take a moment and how would you play? What would you do? It's, kind of, it's, an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting question, and it's what in part led us to, uh, to work on this. But I would like also you to reflect for a moment that this is also not that trivial to organize. And I think DARPA, in a sense, um, merits some praise in the sense that they have had to take some interesting choices. For instance, how will you prove that the, a binary was exploited? Now, as you were saying before, you know, in classic CTF, you're given a binary. And you know, maybe the binary, there's a, flag, there's a file called flag. You need to read the flag. Or you examine the thing, you see, oh, there's a winning message and there's a losing message. I need to make the program print the winning message. Or maybe it's a storage server, and the secrets are the secrets that are stored in these files that have certain names, and so on and so on and so forth. As you can imagine, this is a lot more complication for a program to analyze. This is useless complication, in a sense. So DARPA introduced for the calls, for the qualification round, a very simple way to define what is an exploit. You have exploited a program, and you demonstrate that you have exploited it by giving an input that will crash the program. Segmentation fault, whatever. If you cra the benign program will not crash. If you make the program crash, good. You, find, you found an exploit, and you're going to get the points for the exploit. Easy? Is it easy? Well, don't forget that. The competition also includes a defense component. So what, are you gonna, what do you think is going to be the defense? Is it just going to be that you know, the program just needs to run until the end? I mean, if it, if it doesn't crash and it doesn't time out, it's good? I mean, obviously, you could say, well, yeah, that would work. But then I can just submit this as a patch program and <laughs> believe you know, this is the what is usually, if you have played some of these CTFs, you may have heard the term the Superman defense. Uh, usually in this competition, you want to avoid organizers and even players, of course, want to avoid uh, defense systems that work every time, no, in a sense, no skill required or very little skill required or in a sense that work in every binary. So how do you prevent this from happening? Well. This one is relatively easy. Basically, you need to put in some functionality checks. So that means that whoever writes the program, not only you write the code of the program, not only you put in a vulnerability in the program, you also need to put in a, um, some scripts that will check the functionality of the service. For instance, if the service is a palindrome finder, 
you need to write some script that send words and see if the program correctly says palindrome, not a palindrome, and goes on and on. And of course, uh, you also want to make sure that these checks are in a way meaningful and not easily patched. For instance, if the program just admits two good value of inputs and two easy answers to those two, or even complicated answer, then you want to avoid that you know, the, the team can patch just by making an uh, if this input, then this output, if this other input, then this output, otherwise exit zero. So again, this takes a little bit more skill than, uh, than it sounds. Ooh, this was a secret. Now, um, what is another way that you can build a Superman defense? Another way is that you could have what is called a uh, out-of-band error handling. So you're running the service, you're running the, the program. The program, for instance, tries to uh, use a, um, uh, an unmapped address. And the program is going to get a segmentation fault. And ordinarily, this would be considered a crash. But if I can install a signal handler, then I can turn all these crashes into benign exits. And I, since I know that for benign inputs, the program will never do a zigzag, I'm sure that I can do exit zero without compromising the functionality check. So once again, Superman defends. My program cannot be exploited. And the solution for this is that, in a sense, or at least the solution that DARPA took for this is that there is no out-of-band error handling. There's no, at least no easy way to do out-of-band exception handling, error handling. But as many of you may be uh, familiar with terms such as a DBT or an emulator, like the MAME, for instance, the emulator for consoles, um, what would prevent me from writing an interpreter? Okay, so. I don't actually run the x86 instructions, you understand? Like, I can run these instructions in my little VM, my little uh, VMware or VirtualBox or MAME. And whenever I detect that the CPU would raise an exception, for instance, because it's, again, uh, segmentation fault, uh, out of band, you know, uh, accessing unmapped memory, division by zero, whatever, again, I'm going to exit zero. Now, please take a moment. How would you prevent me from doing this? It's not as easy as it sounds. And that, in my opinion, took the elegant and also very correct solution. You don't. This is perfectly allowed in DARPA CGC. The, the, the point is that you pay for that. So sure, you can do whatever you want. You can even write an entire um, binary translation platform. In fact, uh, one of the qualifying teams, uh, uh, non-qualifying bins, sorry, Trail of Bits, actually did something close to this. We obviously don't know the full details, but they did a uh, transition to an LLVM intermediate, and they went back. And I encourage you to read the blog post from them, because they, uh, no, 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 but not because it's a stupid way. It's actually a, a very good way. And you will see that, uh, in a sense, you run into a risk that uh, you need to make a very good estimate of what's the cost of the defense that you're putting in. If the defense that you're putting in ends up consuming too much CPU or maybe too much memory, then you may lose points in your, even if your defense is perfect in itself, you may have, lose, you may have lost points in this. And I'm just going to give you a couple of extra ideas of the competition. Um, obviously, you want the competition to work on realistic programs. You want programs that can do more or less what the programs that we run on our laptops can do. Uh, so no hello world only. Uh, but you also don't want extra complication. And what do I mean by this? It's a little fuzzy as a term. But basically, you need to think of this, that um, the advantage, the work that the teams are going to put and the advantage that you're going to take by sh looking at how they do things Teams have a limited amount of time. So do you really want the modeling, the, the team to spend a ton of time modeling the entire, you know, horrible things like interruptible syscalls or an entire model of file system and so on and so forth? So usually not. You need to find some sort of compromise. And again, I think DARPA found a good compromise here. The architecture that is being used is regular, Intel x86. 
all opcodes, all user land opcodes at the very least, are fair game. So all the problems that I'm sure you're familiar with, such as problems in disassembly and so on and so forth, are all there. So it's re very realistic. But the OS is a somewhat limited form of a Linux-like, Unix-like operating system, as you can see. You have some basic syscall, transmit and receive. They're basically read and write from, from the standard in, started out, and um, sockets that connect programs together. You also have a form of select that also allows you to sleep, wait. You have some form of malloc and, uh, and unmap, so to speak. But this can even uh, allow you to, write, to map executable code pages. So if you want, you can even write a just-in-time compiler in this in this, in this architecture. You have randomness. You have the way, obviously, to exit the program. Uh, probably the biggest um, simplification with respect to um, the capabilities of a full um, real-world Linux program is that there's no shared memory, no threads with shared memory. Uh, particularly interesting, at least to me, is that DARPA took the bring your own defense approach really to the to the maximum extent. So you do not even have, by default, the usual, so to speak, the defenses that are common nowadays. So the stack is executable like it was ages ago. There's no ASLR. There's no nothing. You want this stuff, you have to bring it. You have to patch your program, modify your program so that it has them. I, I think it was an interesting, um, interesting uh, idea from DARPA. And as we have seen in the, case of, in the Trail of Bits case, this brings with itself some non-trivial choices on the, on the team side. So now we're going to give you, I'm going to pass the torch to my colleague Antonio, uh, who's going to introduce a little bit our cyber reasoning system, so our, the way we play the game. So let's go. OK. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce the cyber reasoning system we developed. That what, what is a cyber reasoning system? It's just the way DARPA defined the system we, have, we had to develop to participate to, to CGC. And so as Jacopo introduced, as an input, we have a list of binaries. And for, uh, for each one of these binary, we need to uh, produce an exploit that is an input that is going to make this uh, binary crash and uh, a patch version of this binary that is immune to these exploits but still preserve uh, at least some functionality. And so let's see our system a little bit more in details. So we have an out, um, basically the, the vulnerable binaries are passed to an automatic vulnerability finding component that is, of, uh, that is as the name says, uh, trying to automatically find uh, vulnerabilities into these binaries. And then both the exploits generated by the system and the vulnerable binary binaries are passed to an automatic patching component that is trying to uh, generate the patch version of these uh, binaries. And of course, and some of the patching strategies actually require exploits to generate a patch version of a binary that are immune against a specific exploit. So that's the reason of that arrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, both uh, proposed exploits and proposed patches are evaluated by another component that is um, evaluating them in terms of how, uh, how good a patch version is. Is it preserving functionality? Is it crashing because there was some bug in our system? So we are evaluating this. And of course, the best exploit and the best patches, uh, the best patch we have for a specific binary is, is finally submitted to, to DARPA for, for their evaluation. So that's the general uh, idea of our system. And for the next of the presentation, we are going to focus on the automated uh, vulnerability component. And uh, so let's see what we did. So, so here, for, for the qualification, remember that uh, a, an exploit is just a program that is making, it is just an input that is making your binary uh, crash. So that, that's the question we want to answer. How do I crash a binary? But this question is uh, some, somehow a subset of, uh, of a bigger question, of a much more difficult question. It is, how do I reach a specific state within the execution of a binary? So this is a, a, an undecidable problem in the, in the general sense. But there are some approaches that can uh, solve this problem in a good amount of cases. And so I'm 
these are the two approaches we, we, we used. So one is, is a fuzzing, and the other one is a symbolic execution. So let's see first as, um, how these two approaches are, uh, work uh, in general, and then how we, we use them. So about fuzzing, so the question, the, so as I say, the, the, the question we want to answer in general is how do I reach a state within a program? And if you see at this uh, code that I, I put uh, in, the, in the slide, we have a very simple problem, program that is getting an input from the user, putting in a variable hex, then it does two different checks, and then it can either print you win or you lose. So suppose that we want to understand how the text you win is printed, which is, uh, how, which is the input we need to provide to, to reach that state. So of course, the easiest thing we can do is just to, to test a lot of inputs. So we can try with one, and you lose is printed. We can try with two, still you lose. But when, you try with, when, when we try with 10, we will reach that instruction, so our, we will reach the state we were looking for. So fuzzing is in, in, the, in the simple way is just trying a lot of different inputs. But specifically for, for CGC, we used, uh, we used fuzzing and we used a, 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 way of, um, a, a method called coverage-guided fuzzing that means that the execution of the program, uh, the program was executed in an instrumental environment, environment that was taking uh, track of how much a, a, a given input uh, was uh, uh, covering of the entire code base of the binary. And this uh, system was focusing on, basically, on those inputs that were more promising. So those inputs that were increasing the most the general coverage of the, of the program. So our system was based on an already existing system called AFL. That's the link to the original version of AFL. And uh, this system was really was, was effective. But uh, there, are also, there are specific cases in which this system cannot work, or at least cannot work efficiently. So let's see an example. So here we have the same code as before, but the, the only, there is one difference in, in, the second, uh, in the second conditional instruction. So here, x needs, the, 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 the square of x needs to be equal to, to that uh, big uh, constant value. So of course, it's really unlikely that just by trying uh, a lot of different inputs, we will actually find by, by luck or by any method uh, the specific uh, solution of that equation. So as a possible solution, we can use uh, symbolic execution. So let's go back for a second to the, uh, for, to the original example. So the general idea of symbolic execution is to interpret the binary code and replace user input with symbolic variables. So the first instruction is getting some input from the user. We don't know what the user is uh, putting here as a, as a, in the general case. And so our symbolic execution engine will just keep track of this by putting a, a variable x within the, the current state of the execution. So then we go on executing the program normally. And, uh, but of course, if we, if we, if we reach a, a, a conditional instruction like this, we don't know which, kind, which of the two branches we need to take, because we don't know the value of, of, of x. So what we do here is that we take both branches. We take both branches, but we, we keep track of the constraint that a, a branch is, um, is, is putting on a specific path. So in the path in which, in, in, the, in the first uh, branch of this conditional instruction, of course, if we take it, x needs to be bigger or equal than 10. And in the other, x needs to be less than 10. So the execution goes on, keeping track of these constraints. So suppose that now we symbolically execute starting from the state on the left. So now we encounter a second, uh, a second conditional instruction. And uh, as before, we generate two different states. In one, x, we have an additional constraint we have an additional constraint that says x needs to be less than 100. And in the other state, we have a constraint that says x needs to be bigger or equal than 100. So but now we reach actually the condition we were looking for. That is, in this case, the text you win is printed. So when we reach a condition that we were looking for, we can ask to the symbolic execution engine to actually to, to concretize this input. That is, to give us a, 
to give us a, a concrete value that satisfies both constraints, in this case 99, and if you in fact put 99 as an input, you will reach that condition. And of course, if we go to the more complicated example for the symbolic execution is not engine, it's not that complicated to deal with this. We just have a different constraint, but still any symbolic solver can still solve these equations and give the correct answer that is one, two, three, four, five. So we, we use a symbolic execution for CGC. In particular, we use the symbolic execution engine of Hangar, that is uh, the binary platform developed the binary analysis platform developed at UCSB. And in particular, we were looking for, to, for two different conditions. So one is uh, memory accesses outside the uh, allocated regions, and the other was uh, unconstrained instruction pointer. So unconstrained instruction pointer means you have, for instance, a jump instruction that is jumping to the value of a register, but the value of, of that register is coming from the user input. So the symbolic execution engine doesn't know where to jump. So why we were looking for these two conditions? Well, because if you reach one of these two conditions, it means that you also found a, a crash, a, an input that will make the program crash, either because the program, uh, given that input, will access uh, an, a not allocated memory or will just jump to non-existing uh, code. And uh, so as a, as in a general idea, so we, we, for, for the final, we are exploring the idea of combining the two approaches. And in particular, a paper has been, uh, has been accepted at the NDSS conference, and it will be published in February, and uh, it will be presented in February at the NDSS, just to give you a, a, a preview of the results of that paper. So if these are the entire binaries we had to solve for, for CGC, the, for the qualification, these are uh, in scale, more or less. So these are the, the amount of binaries we found uh, we can find a, a, so a, an exploit using fuzzing. This is the amount of binary uh, we can find a, a, an exploit using symbolic execution. But combining the two, we can find even more binaries, uh, even more exploits. And so the, the bigger circle is the amount of, uh, bin uh, the, of binaries we were able to exploit using this new approach. So I suggest you to, to read the paper as soon as it will be uh, public. So OK. now. Andrew will introduce Anger, and he will give us a live demo. Good. Hello. Oh, I'm audible. Good. I'm going to talk about Anger. I'm the angry one. Um, Anger is a pretty, it's a Python, the Python library. You use it. It has code. You can run the code. And it does binary analysis. It does all the things that Antonio just finished talking about and more. Um, it's open source because we believe in that sort of thing. Um, and it's interesting to note that the anger started because of one of the other graduate students in our lab wanted to do a project on firmware analysis and got carried away. And since then, that project has grown and become adapted to CGC and Linux binaries and all those different architectures. So it's had its the multi platformness baked in from the beginning. And it, I, said, I said it is written in Python. This is just because we're a, we're a research lab. We need to move fast and break things. We don't really have the luxury to program in something like C++ or OCaml, not that we'd ever want to. And because of the magic of Linux and the Python package index, you too can have it with those one or maybe two commands. The two, one is if you're willing to forego the support we, have, we are providing you. Um, so. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to dem demonstrate using Anchor to automatically find vulnerabilities. The automatic part is, we'll see. So we're going to show off the finding the, gr the grub back to 28 vulnerability, which you may have seen recently. There's been a lot of news coverage about a vulnerability in the Grand Unified Bootloader versions 1.98 through 2.02, .02, that if you press backspace 28 times and then return on the grub password username prompt, you will get a rescue shell, which is an interesting vulnerability. And it is due to an unchecked integer underflow in the username and password input function. So as you can see on the screen, um, there's a link to the actual write-up of this vulnerability, which we copied a lot of stuff from for the explanation. And the specific vulnerable part of the code doesn't check underflows. It just simply decrements the in index into the current input buffer. 
So then later in the function, what it does is it clears the unused parts of the buffer with this memset command. And the, the problem is that is that you can make the current length negative. So if you make the length negative, all of a sudden the, it's, it's memsetting other parts of the stack, like the return address. So if, if it's, once it sets it all to zero, then it's, the program is going to jump to zero and crash, except that this is in x86, very low level stuff, and somehow this is possible. The explanation of why this, is, this can be exploited successfully is well outside the scope of this talk, but please read that right up, it's very nice. So finding this automatically is going to be very difficult because as you see there on the screen is a control flow graph of the vulnerable function in the grub binaries. And as you can see, it's got a big loop with a whole bunch of paths. And if you take a symbolic executor and throw it at this problem and say, find me a crashing input, the universe is going to grow old and die before anything interesting happens. It's too much state. You're going to go through the loop once, you're going to produce 10 successor states, each one of which has gone through the loop. Then each of those 10 needs to be put through the loop again. They will all each generate 10 children, and you're going to have an exponential state explosion, and your computer is going to run out of RAM realistically. So I have a demonstration here of the naive approach of symbolic execution, the, the grub naive the grub naive script, which is just a using anger as a naive symbolic executor. So most of this, um, most of this is simply setting up the grub state because we we realistically cannot execute symbolically grub from the very beginning of, of program boot. So we cho we choose to start our execution in the program. This is something that anger can do. You can construct a you can construct your own state, which is the line that does the state construction. It's down here. It just constructs a blank, a blank slate, blank state that you can use to symbol symbolically execute as, as symbolically as you like. And then simply, simply steps the path group until it finds, until it finds something that has jumped to zero. And as we see here, I've also set it to print out its uh, current internal anger state at every step. We can see that very quickly it's starting up, it's executing lots and lots of symbolic states. You can see the, the active number is becoming larger and larger as the program slows down more and more. And if we look at my memory consumption, we can see that it's slowly going up and it's going to run out eventually. We're not going to let it get there because I like this computer. Um, in, so in general, the security community has attempted to solve this kind of state explosion problem in loops with a technique called veritesting. That's from a, a Carnegie Mellon University paper. Um, Anger implements this. I tried it. It doesn't work because um, it simply generates too much complexity for the constraint solver to handle. It's a bit more of a technical dis discussion that we can have later in the workshop. Um, however, Anger does let you solve this problem because, because symbolic execution is powerful, but it's really dumb. It's going to take, spend all this time computing things that don't need to be computed, but, and, the, and so, you, on the other hand, you are very clever and you know how to smartly navigate the state space of this program in order to not waste your effort, but there's no way that you could realistically do that with the precision and care of a symbolic executor. So the solution is anger. Anger provides an interface for you to channel your anger effectively. <laughs> Search your feelings. You know it to be true. So what you can do in order to solve this vulnerability, this is what I did last night to prepare for this demo, is to, ex to manually examine all the surplus of s symbolic states that anger produces and figure out what's going wrong. And you can see that it's doing all sorts of things that you would never do if you were personally exploring the state space of this program, like entering several letters in a row and then deleting them or pressing the home button multiple times in a row. You don't need to do that. Yes. Yes. Um, so what you can do is you can just tell Anger to not do these things. And Anger provides 
With the power of angers, it provides reasonable interfaces for you to do this more easily. I took my previous example, the naive approach, added 10 lines of code, and it finds the bug, as we're going to demonstrate. So we say grub bug. And it still prints out, but now we can see that it's finding a whole bunch of not unique paths that it's discarding. And now the computation load is very easy for the symbolic executor process, and it finds the crashing input, which is 28 backspaces in a return. So that's a lie for the demo. Just a couple of side notes that um, this is. I am. If you, look, if you look at the, if you look at the script itself, you can see at the top it's straight up loading the Grub executable out of my operating system. I haven't upgraded, done a system upgrade in several months, so I'm still vulnerable. Please don't hack me. Um, but what I, what I was previously doing is I was previously using trying to exploit the 64-bit version, and it didn't work because this exploit doesn't work on 64-bit systems because of some the way the compiler uses RAX versus EAX, and it's a mess. But I didn't know this until I had written the entire exploit and found that it didn't work. So after a little bit of manual analysis, I realized this was the reason, so I just switched over to the 32-bit version, and all I had to do in the Anger script was change the word sizes and the program address. Anger is incredibly versatile, and it can handle all different kinds of programs. It can handle binary blobs, it can handle firmware images, it can handle PE and ELF and maybe Mako files. <laughs> and I don't know. There's my opinion is the power of anger in the, is in, in, in the interface. And I recognize that this is a very dissonant message from what we were talking about earlier with the automated hacking stuff. But the point is that this is why the cyber grand challenge is hard. The secret sauce in our CRS is not something that we can talk about under penalty from my professor. Can't do it. And that's so. Do, so I'm emphasizing how user how user friendly anger is because that's the way that you're going to be using it. We're going to be using it as an automated system, which is a lot of really complicated algorithms. Um, that's all I have to say. Back to one of the two, I forget which, to talk about the finals of the Cybercrime Challenge. So let's go back to something a little bit less technical. Mm -hmm. So we, we, so we played the, the qualification, seven teams best, as Jacopo said. Shellfish was one of them. In particular, we exploited 44 binaries out of the 131 uh, provided by DARPA. And every qualified team uh, received uh, $750,000 as a prize. So that is a good thing to have. And. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So for the finals, the setup of the competition will be different. Uh, in particular, many different many things will be different. So the the finals will be a round base attack defense CTF. So for the qualification, we just receive all the binaries, and then we had 24 hours to automatically find exploits, patch them, and, and submit these uh, these patches and these uh, exploits to to, to DARPA. In, instead, here it's a round base attack defense in which. At every round, we receive uh, new attacks from other teams, and we can submit new patches. So the, the, this is not 100% finalized right now, but there will probably be no possibility of human intervention or very limited possibility of human intervention, whereas during the qualification phase, it was at least possible to fix bugs, for instance, if you forget to uh, put a file as executable uh, because you didn't sleep for the previous week. So something like that. And maybe there may be some possibility of bug fixing you even during the finals, because of course everyone wants to avoid that you work for two years on something, then you forgot you forget some a semicolon and all your work is pointless. Since something like this happened for the for the grand challenge with cars, so they may want to avoid this somehow. But they don't want you to adapt to exploits sent by the other teams. So you need to balance these two things. So another interesting point is that data about previous rounds is available. So first of all, you submit exploits and patch, uh, and patch version of binaries, and you can get from the system the, the performance they, are, uh, they, they have. So you can adapt 
based on that. But also anon anonymized traffic sent by other teams against you, you can receive it and you can analyze it. And you can even receive at every team patches that other teams, a patched version of binaries that other teams uh, submitted. So this brings to a lot of interesting uh, scenarios in which you may be able to steal uh, patch binaries from other teams. You may be even able to uh, steal exploits. So there is some, probably some metagaming you may want to do about deciding how to patch, what to patch. Uh, we j maybe you can just steal a patch or and, and wait uh, before, develop, uh, before deploying your patch. We, we, don't, we don't know yet, but there may be some metagaming we need to reason about it. And uh, yes, also this is important. So exploits are going to be different. So for the qualification, an exploit was just an input that was making your program crash. For the finance, there will be two different types of exploits. So the f type one is basically a, 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 an exploit is, is, a, is a, some code that receives a specific location, a specific register, and a specific value from the organizer. And then this code generates an input for a binary that is making the binary crash at that specific location and also setting a register to a specific value. So this is somehow a way to the DARPA has to check that you kind of uh, reach a state in which you, you actually exploited the binary. So the binary is, is under your uh, almost full control. Also, another kind of exploit is a, a type 2 exploit in which you have to leak data from a specific memory uh, page provided by the organizer. And uh, so for this, we, we will need some more realistic exploit generation and we are working on using Hangar to do something different, that is to automatically generate a ROP chain as a part of the exploits. Also, as an addition to all of this, there will be the possibility to deploy network level uh, filtering rules. So during the competition, there will be an uh, intrusion detection system from, for which you can provide rules that prevent traffic to reach your services. And for instance, a rule can be uh, if a packet has this string, just block it. But of course, you want to deploy these rules, but in a way that you are not uh, impacting the functionality of your services. So this is a, a completely new area we have to explore. So every team has access to a cluster of 1,280 cores, 16 terabytes of RAM, and 128 terabytes of storage. This is a picture of one, one of it. And uh, so right now we can access to this through SSH, but uh, for the final, they will bring seven of these to, to one for each team to the hotel where DEF CON is. And so it seems that they will also bring a half a megawatt uh, generator to power all these things and <laughs> cool them. And, uh, and so, of course, the first thing we did when we, we got access was to run HTOP. And then we spent other two hours trying to run HTOP on all of them at the same time <laughs> using, using Terminator. <laughs> and yes, that's a huge screenshot of like 5,000 pixels, something like that. <laughs> so, okay, so finance will, be, uh, will take place in August 2016 at DEF CON Las Vegas. There will be money prizes, so the first place is $2 million, second place $1 million. Th uh, third place is uh, $750,000. And as Jacopo said, the winning team will compete against human teams at DEF CON CTF Finals. And it seems that the winning team will have access to uh, the entire uh, seven clusters. So the winning team will, ha will have access to something around 100 terabytes of RAMs, something like that. <laughs> so, and we'll try to compete against humans, so we don't know. So because of this, uh, because of this uh, it seems that uh, next year, uh, DEF CON uh, CTF Finals, all the binaries for, for the finance will follow the CGC format so that humans and, 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 and uh, these automatic systems can play uh, against each other. And so I just want to conclude with a picture with all of, uh, all of uh, shellfish uh, persons that uh, contributed for the qualification. You can also see my Photoshop skills. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so then, uh, since the qualification, other two uh, members uh, star started working on this. And as you can see, we are from all over the world, and Italians, uh, the number of Italians surpassed the number of Americans. And, <laughs> okay. And uh, so we will have a, a workshop after this talk uh, in all 13. 
And so let's bring your laptop, and we will show you a lot of things. So all 13, I have a map. But it's really hard to find rooms here, so just follow us. I think that's the easiest way. And yes. It's really not that hard. You yeah, go yeah, yeah, the yeah. elevator and go across the hall. It says there's a 13 this way. Good. And we are going to show probably some easy example that you can, you can just do it by yourself. And then probably we're going to maybe show more in details what, uh, Ang what uh, Andrew uh, showed us during the demo. And with this, I put some references. The, the DARPA presentation at DEF CON is on YouTube. That's pretty interesting if you are interested on CGC. I put our emails, some uh, websites, and so we are ready to answer to your questions. Thank you, thank you very much. That is a good thing. You can leave if you absolutely need to. Please be quiet while doing so and only do it through the stage exit. So keep the voices down. You don't need your voices to leave the room so that uh, people who want to ask questions can ask questions. So I, there's a bit of... Uh, Turmoil now, we wait a few seconds until that clears up. No, no. Same. Just for the info, there are how many questions from the internet? Okay, I get that. Okay, to not waste any time for the Q&A, we will just start. So um, let's have the first question from the front microphone on the right side, please. Hi, I'm uh, from one, one of the other teams who have uh, previously uh, participated in DEF CON. Um, my question is, uh, previously it has been kind of hard to get, um, to get uh, funding for uh, IT security research, at least uh, at least if you're doing uh, CTF-like stuff. Why do you think DARPA has uh, put this huge amount of money uh, into into this uh, uh, cyber challenge? Is uh, do, what do you think their motivation for doing that is? Uh, do you have an answer? Well, I mean, on one side, I guess you could say that maybe the situation has evolved enough, and I mean. If you follow, for instance, the, um, for instance, AFL has definitely proven that it can find many, many bugs almost automatically. If you follow the um, conferences, you'll see that uh, static analysis has made uh, many, many improvements. So maybe DARPA thought that you know, the, uh, it's ripe enough to start challenging people. Uh, but I guess ultimately, it's a question for DARPA. Okay, so let's have the next question from the internet, Signal Angel. Yeah, question from the internet is uh, what kind of answer you got for your Freedom of Information Act request? So, so can, you, can you repeat the...? Uh, in one of the last slides we saw uh, an example of a Freedom of Information Act request and the internet was asking if you got an answer on that or what, what kind of answer you got. Freedom of information request. We That's what the internet is asking. <laughs> I don't know. The internet is wrong, we think. Good. Okay. I mean, the... what, what can I say is that I think after the competition, I think we are going to release most of the code, if not all the code. So, but I don't understand <laughs> the question. And, and also, no, another thing, so all the submitted uh, binary, all the binaries that have been submitted for the qualification, and all the, so all the patch binaries, all the, the, the exploits, they are uh, available on the DARPA website. So if you even want to understand what teams, all the teams did, you can just get the, those binaries, reverse them, and you can have an idea what teams are doing. And that's all I can say. Yes, and DARPA also has... Uh, man, not all, but most of DARPA's code, such as the Linux modification and so on and so forth, every, all of that is public. Is public, and uh, yeah. So if you want to take a look, I believe at the moment you you can get a good look, and certainly after the final, uh, this will probably improve a lot more. So I think there is a good amount of release 
of information, obviously, uh, I mean, we don't control everything, so, and the competition is still ongoing, so. Okay, is that a question on my right side, on your left side? No, that's no question. Uh, do you have a question? You're standing. People are just standing. Okay, is there another question from the internet? There's no question from the internet. That would be then the perfect point to wrap up. And oh, there's, there's one, one microphone question over there. One last question. Do you think two million is a fair price for an automatic exploit creation tool? <laughs> Do you want more? Do you want? Do you think we should get more? Or less? I think you should get more. <laughs> yes, it's very, this is very difficult, and it's this is it's consuming the time of base. It, it could consume the time of all of our researchers. It cannot consume the time of all of our researchers because there are other projects our lab must be doing. But it's an incredibly difficult program. It is tantamount to creating uh, the first. I, it's not quite the first step to a, like a Terminator-esque dystopian hacking robot future, but um, it's very good inroads if you're into that sort of thing. No, I mean, you're giving them a tool to, with some improvements, exploit almost every binary program for only two million. <laughs> Well, if, if anybody in this room would like to talk to DARPA about extending the grand prize, I would be happy to help them with that. <laughs> but at the moment, the, even the $750,000 is going to fund Shellfish going to DEF CON and eating pizza for the next 20 years. <laughs> OK. <laughs> then wrap up. So. Thank you, Antonio, Jacopo, and Andrew, for this very nice talk. And uh, be sure to join them on their workshop.